Hello and congratulations on getting access to this video course on getting traffic from Pinterest. This of course is video number one, which is the introduction and we're going to dive right in. First things first, I want to talk about the mindset and we really want to focus on quality over quantity. And what do I mean by that? What I mean is that this is not about how much traffic that you can get from your Pinterest images, but rather how much quality traffic that you can get from Pinterest. So as long as you're thinking of, okay, rather than getting thousands of traffic and thousands of visitors to my Pinterest, and, and while that is good, you would rather have 10 or 50 or even 100 people who are super targeted, who really want to learn more about your pin and more about what you're having to offer rather than somebody who is just clicking to just click, if that makes sense. And of course, over time, you'll want to get thousands of high quality traffic as well. So here's a quick overview of what we're going to talk about in this video course. Video number one is, of course, this video. Video number two is the platform. So before we can actually talk about how to get traffic from Pinterest, you first and foremost have to understand how Pinterest works. Because a lot of times we assume that all social media platforms work very, very similar. And while yes, there is an element of truth to that, the reality is that Pinterest works very different compared to that of Instagram or Facebook or YouTube or any other social media platform as well. Then of course, video number three, we'll talk about quality and how to make sure that the images to your content and all of that is high quality. And what exactly do we mean by that? And what does the funnel look like from the point of attracting the person to pinning the image, to looking at the image, to getting them over to your content and all of that. Now, what that entails is congruency, which is what we're gonna talk about in video number four. Congruency basically means that everything is consistent from the images attracting the right person to getting them over to the content and giving them exactly what they want and what they desire and the reason for the click in the first place because believe it or not, a lot of people, when they create marketing campaigns, they totally forget about congruency. So they might make a certain image, but when they get people over to a piece of content, it is unrelated. And then of course they wonder why nobody is converting because at the end of the day, it's not congruent. So we'll make sure that you're on the same page in terms of that and how that works in real life. Video number five, we're going to talk about visual real estate matters. So visual real estate is essentially, in this case, an image. Now, how big should the image be? Should it be a small image? Should it be a large image? Which size converts the best? So we'll talk more about that in that particular video. Video number six, we're going to talk about an attractive pin. So in other words, what should your images look like? And then on top of that, I'm sure you're asking, well, what exactly should I put in my images? Is there a formula? Is there a blueprint? And that's what brings us to video number seven, which is the anatomy, or in other words, a breakdown step-by-step -step of what every single image should contain at minimum. Video number eight, we'll talk about the reverse engineering hack. And this little hack here is going to help you figure out some ideas on different images, different angles, and all of that in terms of what you should create. Because a lot of times when you start from scratch, you're thinking, well, what kind of images are pin worthy or what people would want to pin, what people would want to look at? Because you got to remember on Pinterest, that you are competing with thousands of other people who have thousands of other amazing images. So if your image does not stand out, 
then it's going to be essentially put away and not even looked at comparing to the other beautiful images, if that makes sense. And of course, last but not least, we've got video number nine, which is pin automation. Essentially, this is a bonus video to show you how to automate the whole tedious, boring, time-consuming process. All right. So now let's talk about things that you will need to get started. So tools that you're going to need, what you're going to need to have in order to implement what's inside this video course. So obviously you're going to need to have a Pinterest account. You'll need to have a blog or a site with high quality content. If you don't have it right now, that's totally fine, but you will need to have one because you don't really want to direct people directly from your image directly to your sales page because people don't know you. People are still warming up to you. So we'll show you a little bit more in terms of the funnel and how to set up your marketing campaign and all that. But what the high quality content does is it creates a buffer between your sales page and the image or your opt-in page. So you get them on your list, they sign up, you build a relationship with them and then you warm them up. So you got to remember, these are people that you don't know. These are not people that know you. And of course, this is optional, but you'll need some money if you want to make your images look professional and appealing. So if you're not a photographer and you don't really want to hire a photographer and go about doing that, that way you can always purchase what we call royalty free images that are already professionally made that can fit your niche. And we'll talk more about that in a later video. And of course, some money for optional tools, which we'll talk about in video number nine. All right, so with that said, let's move on to video number two. Okay, so welcome back. This is video number two, and this is the platform. So before we get started, it's crucial that we're on the same page. Now, I know you're excited about learning how to use Pinterest to get amazing amounts of high quality traffic, but to ensure that your success is going to be high, we want to make sure that you're hitting or at least close to the bullseye. What do I mean by that? So if you can imagine a bullseye or a dartboard and you're trying to aim for the center bullseye. So that's what we're talking about here. Now, you see, before you can get traffic from Pinterest, you need to understand how it works and how it's different from other social media platforms. A lot of people tend to make the mistake of assuming that Facebook and Pinterest and Instagram and all the other social media platforms are the same. So we don't want that. We want to make sure that you understand how Pinterest works. That way you can understand what types of people are going to Pinterest, what they're looking for, what is, what is the culture. And if you understand that, it's going to be easier to help you communicate with these types of people. So it's very different. It's kind of like walking into a formal business meeting and assuming that they're your friends. Well, obviously the way that you would treat your friends would be very different from how you would interact people in this formal business meeting. Or say you go to a place that you don't know the culture. Understanding the culture is going to be good for you because that way you're not going to offend somebody. That way you don't do something that is totally out of norm. You do something in the sense that it will gain their trust at a much faster rate. So that's why we have this particular video because it's very overlooked in terms of not knowing how things work. So same thing. So I want you to reset any assumptions that you have about Pinterest or even any strategies that you've learned over the years about Pinterest. Reset that in your brain. Assume that you don't know anything because that way, when it comes to learning the strategy that is built into this video course, it's going to be a lot easier for you in the long run. 
So what we've seen over the years is a lot of times when you come in with these assumptions, they actually create roadblocks in your mind. So that's the whole goal of this kind of exercise. So go ahead right now, start from a clean slate and you'll do just fine. Now, first, according to HubSpot.com, about 40% of people respond better to visual information than plain text. Now, if you know about Pinterest, you know it's all about images. It's all visual information that is what grabs people in. So when you think about Pinterest, when they're looking through images, they find an image that catches their eye, they click on it, and they get sent to an article. So you want to make sure that your article on the other side also has a lot of visual information and visual content as well. So you don't want to send people from an image directly to an article that is full text. You want to send people directly from the image directly to the content that is filled with either tons of images or videos with visual content as well. So the reason for that is that people's attention spans are just getting shorter and shorter. So you need a quick and fast way to keep them from scrolling or exiting the page or leaving your site. And that's why Pinterest is so powerful because when it comes to visual information, it grabs people in, it gets them really addicted to the social media platform. So let's talk about what Pinterest is all about. So Pinterest is a place in basics for people in different niches to organize and share their discoveries through what we call a Pinterest board. So obviously if you've used Pinterest before, you know what I mean. We have different boards that hold different images. So as you can imagine, boards that are extremely specific are often high converting. Okay, so let me give you an example of a generic board versus a highly specific Pinterest board. So a generic board would be something like a desserts board. So you would have everything from like cupcakes, diet cookies, low sugar cookies, maybe gluten-free cakes or bunt cakes or anything like that. The problem with that is it's too generic. Now, that might be okay if your site is a high authority site and it's got a bunch of different things in a different area. Or if, if it's something specific like maybe basketball, basketball board. And while that might work quite well, it will work even better if you have a very specific board. So, what we've noticed over the years is very specific boards such as, let's say, low sugar diet desserts, or even more specific, low sugar cupcakes. So for folks that are on a maybe low sugar or even no sugar diet, they're going to be very interested in this because when they're on this diet, they are eating literally vegetables and things that they're not really eating any cakes or anything like that. And maybe they're doing that for health reasons. And because of that, they are desperate for low sugar desserts. All right. So maybe that's the type of person that you want to attract. So when they click over, they see an article that says, maybe you're on a diet. Maybe you're doing this for health reasons, but that doesn't mean that you can't eat desserts. And here's a bunch of recipes and maybe you can get them op to opt in to eat your email list and maybe subscribe, you build a relationship and then you sell them later on. But that's how you can essentially attract people who are in a very specific frame of mind. And that is how you will be able to convert people better on Pinterest. So I'm going to break it down. I'm going to dive in in a lot more depth in the future videos. But this is kind of more of an overarching view of what we'll be talking about later on. Now, in terms of Pinterest boards, I want you to note the keyword, which is organization. So that's the big thing about Pinterest that really differentiates between all the other social media platforms. You see, not many social media sites allow you to easily organize content except for really Pinterest. So it's a great place for people who want to learn how to do something to literally organize everything into a board 
So if, if somebody is interested in low sugar cakes, they're going to go there and they realize, oh, wow, I can make this, I can make that, I can make this. And you've got so many recipes that people are interested, they click over and they really get hooked on your board. Now, you could, if you wanted to, create a board of different recipes from either from you, from other competitors, and that's fine. Or you could create a board with all of your recipes on there. So in other words, this is a place where a lot of DIYers go. Now, if you don't know what DIY stands for, it's do it yourself. So people who want to look for recipes, they want to create food, they want to look at projects, maybe home projects, they want to see how to do something, they're most likely inclined to want to buy something, if that makes sense. So as you would guess, Pinterest is the place to go from sharing everything from images, videos, content in order to actually do these projects. Whereas on the other hand, if you think about Facebook, for example, a lot of people are there because they want to know what is going on with their friends and family. They're not really there to necessarily learn. So it's a very different platform in a very different culture and a very different mindset. Now, let's be frank and say that Facebook, while Facebook is great, it's not great for organization. In fact, if you think about it, anytime you create a post of an image or a video, it can easily get lost into the feed as time passes on. And even if you think about Facebook groups, for example, you'll notice that even groups are very, very hard to organize. If somebody posts a post, a lot of times in a Facebook group as well, or even a page, it will eventually go down and it's not really a great place to organize. So Pinterest is great for planning, getting inspiration, organizing, and ultimately implementing, which is usually where the purchase happens. So remember, people are going to Pinterest because they're looking for inspiration. They're looking to organize their house. They're looking to learn something. And if learning something usually leads to buying something. You think about people are looking through recipes. They're going to have to buy food, right? To an ingredients to, to make the food. Or they're looking at home projects. Let's say, for example, how to paint a room. They're eventually going to need to buy paint. They're going to need to buy blueprints on how to go about that. How to build boxes or get some gadgets or crafts, they're going to have to go and buy things. So imagine that, keep that in the back of your mind and understand that people are there to buy. So in hindsight, 2020, you realize that Pinterest can really produce a lot of sales if done right. So that's why we're going to break things down in the next few videos in terms of the funnel and how your marketing campaigns need to be set up. So with that said, let's move on to video number three. Okay, welcome back. This is video number three. So quality is key. Now that you understand how Pinterest works and what type of people use it and their frame of mind and the culture and all of that, let's talk about the images that go to these boards. So images and other visual content must be extremely high quality. Why? Because if you think about it, you are literally competing against thousands of other high quality images. So looking amateur or just throwing up an image just to do that is not a choice because if that's the case, your image is going to be ignored. In fact, you need to know how to create high quality images. If you analyze thousands of Pinterest posts and images and the images that are being pinned, you realize they have something in common. And that commonality is that they are high quality images images and not only that they literally grab people in they have a call to action 
they have specific elements which we'll talk about at a later video when we talk about the anatomy. Now, you can either do this yourself by taking a photography class. In fact, a lot of people that we have noticed that have done really well, they have said that they have gone to take photography classes, they have gotten a really good camera, and they've learned how to take different angles. Now, if that's not something that you really want to do, then, of course, you can purchase royalty-free stock images from BigStockPhoto.com, which is essentially a humongous database of images where you can literally find images of any niche. So if you're looking for images for a baked potato or a chicken parmesan dish, you are more likely to be able to find that on these sites. Now, there are other free sites like Pixabay.com or unsplash.com and you can use these sites to get these images and then of course use an image editor later down the road to make it look good now we recommend that you do all of this later once you figure out and understand what each image should contain so it's not about just slapping a bunch of images or downloading them from royalty free stock sites and then uploading them it's a matter about getting these images and then, of course, using an image editor, which we'll show you later on, on how to make it look more fancy. Or you can also hire somebody to do it for you. So if you have products that you're selling, then you can actually send these products to somebody who is a professional product photographer. And you can find these people on Upwork.com or even Fiverr.com. And they will literally take a photograph of your products in different angles to make it look really good. So if you think about when you buy a hamburger, a lot of times when you see these commercials with hamburgers, you see that they look really amazing, they look beautiful, but then when you get the hamburger from the restaurant, it, it looks nothing like it. So these product photographers really know how to make your product stand out and look really a appealing, enticing, and it's something that people want to click on. So that's just something to think about. If you don't have the time or any of that to do that, then you can hire somebody to do that for you. So I wanted to make sure that I cover different avenues so that you understand what options essentially that you have. So the point of all of this is that crap does not survive Pinterest. So if you take the photograph yourself and it doesn't look that great, then at the end of the day, it may not convert. So another myth that I want to say is that a lot of times people will say, if you buy this software that will pin thousands of images, you'll get tons and tons of traffic back. Now, some of that software out there is legit and does work. But then some of the software out there that is automated and will pin thousands of images and it'll grab maybe some images from Pixabay automatically and all that. Yeah, that's more of the quantity kind of mindset than quality. So what we're going here is about quality. So if you see a software that is selling you, hey, buy the software and you get hundreds of traffic right away, they might work, they may not, but at the end of the day, we really need to focus on quality over quantity. So rather than doing that, you really want to think about how you can use the right images in your campaign. If you think about how can I get somebody interested in this product? So when they click on it, they get sent to a piece of content that describes and elaborates further of the reasoning of clicking on it. If so, if they click on a link about chicken parmesan, obviously you're going to want to send them to a article about chicken parmesan. You don't want to send them to an article about chicken. Even though they're both chicken, they need to be exact, if that makes sense. So maybe you can send them to a video on how to make chicken parmesan. And you show them how to make it, but you 
talk about the ingredients, but you don't go in depth. So you say, if you want to get this recipe or the secret recipe, or you want to get some bonus videos and this recipe, sign up here on this free list and you can give it to them. And if you can imagine you will attract somebody, you'll build a list of people who are extremely targeted. So basically what I'm saying is forget about all the software that promises you that you're going to get thousands of clicks to your website. Really focus on the quality of the click or how you create the marketing campaign first and how you're going to convert cold traffic into prospective buyers. So another key point here, which I've touched base on is congruency is making sure that your image matches your content, which we'll discuss in the next video. Now, remember the image that you put up will attract and excite someone. You want to attract the right person. So really knowing and understanding the demographics or what your person that you're trying to attract what will look like is really the first step to a successful marketing campaign. So if we go back to the person who might be looking for low sugar cupcakes, that type of person, why are they looking for low sugar? Maybe they are on a diet. Why are, are they on a diet? Are, do they have some sort of health issues or do they have cholesterol or low cholesterol diet? Are they facing a specific problem? You really need to think about that because if you do, then you can talk about that in your article or your image and you can grab people in. So you could do something like low cholesterol cupcakes, for example, or healthy desserts for diabetics kind of thing. So you, you know when you track that type of person, they are maybe going through diabetes or low cholesterol or, or specific reasoning. And because of that reasoning, you're able to talk with them. You're able to gain their trust. And in the article, you could say, hey, here's some low sugar cupcakes for diabetics and all that. And that way you can relate to them on a deeper level. So maybe in the article, in the opt-in in the autoresponder series, you can literally talk to them and say, hey, you know, being a diabetic is hard because you can't eat certain foods. But I want to say that there's certain foods that you can eat and still enjoy life kind of thing. And that's how you're going to be able to sell. It's not about getting thousands of clicks to from your image to your article. It's about getting the 10 people or the 20 people that really understand what you're talking about. Because in that way, in that light, they're going to be more open to actually buying from you, if that makes sense. So one way of doing this is to take a look at magazines in your niche. Magazines are really great ways to figure out what kind of images that you can actually use that will excite people. Because a lot of these magazine companies will invest millions and thousands of dollars and hundreds of thousands of dollars into figuring out what actually works with their prospects and their customers and their buyers. So let's go ahead and do that right now. Okay, so to keep it simple, we can go to magazines.com and you'll literally see hundreds of different magazines. If you click on the all categories here, you'll be able to see the different categories. We have animal pets, we have art, we have fashion, we have all sorts of things. But to keep it simple, I'm going to type in recipe and let's just see what we get. So we've got cooking, food, and beverage, magazine subscriptions. Now, obviously, I'm not going to be able to look inside the magazine, but just by taking a look at them will allow me to get a better idea of what they're putting out. Now, sometimes you can even do a reverse engineering and do a Google search on that magazine 
And sometimes these sites will have websites. So that's something that we'll actually do. So all recipes is an actual website. So we know that, but let's just go ahead and click this. So we got DIY donuts and DIY. Remember we mentioned that was do it yourself. So we already know right off the bat that people that are into allrecipes.com are people that are interested in doing it themselves. And that really matches the type of person that we're trying to track with Pinterest. Now, if we go here, Let's see here, we click this, we can just click these images to kind of get an idea of the way that they have set up their images. And you can actually copy this and not actually copy exact, but get an idea of, okay, they're using plates, they're putting words on top of here, and they're putting text on the side and that's what makes it look good. So you could do something very similar. Now let's do a search on all recipes. We know that this is actually a website, but let's go ahead and click more info before we do that. We see here, we read this. Let's just go back to allrecipes.com. So we can see 12 delicious chicken thigh dinners. Now, one little tip that I'm gonna give you is that a lot of times with Pinterest type articles, if you can do something like the top five or the top 10 or, or 10 chicken dinners or 10 maybe low carb desserts or five top five low sugar desserts kind of thing, that actually will do really well. And those tend to get pinned a lot because it's not just one, it's many, and they're definitely interested in that. So we can see in terms of the images that could potentially be pinned, they're simply pictures of the food. Now, in terms of images, you can kind of get away with this with food because and without any words or anything like that. But by adding words in some sort of call to action, such as want this recipe, click here. If somebody pins that, they're most likely going to click there versus they're just seeing this because they don't exactly know what this is. So you could put the words baked teriyaki chicken on this so that somebody knows, okay, this is baked teriyaki chicken because not all the time what can you take a look at an image and know exactly what it is all about but if you notice one thing that I mentioned earlier is that this article is a great example of going from an image to an article that has tons of visual information and visual content so you can see that this page is literally filled with images so it's got about 12 images and in terms of text, very little text. So that's something to keep in mind with Pinterest is that a lot of people go there looking for images. When they click on an image, they're not looking for a full article of text. They're looking for more images. So if you can do that, that will keep people on your site and that will get people more engaged. Hello and welcome back. This is video number four and let's talk about congruency. So visual content that are pinned must go to high quality written content like blog articles, websites in order to be shared. In other words, your image should show the end result or the end desire. And we'll talk more about that in just a minute. Your content should partially explain how to achieve the end result or end desire. So whatever you are selling will complete this solution. So let me explain. It should look like something like this. The image is the first thing that people see on Pinterest. They click it because they're interested in it. 
And we're talking about people that are on the Pinterest site. So not to be confused with people who have pinned the image. So these are people on the Pinterest site that are looking on the Pinterest boards. They see an image that they like, they click it, and then they get sent to a written article. Now, a lot of people make the mistake of sending people directly to the sales page. And that's a big no-no because you're dealing with people that don't know you. You're not gonna go up to some random people and say, hey, can I have your phone number? Or you wanna go buy from me? You're gonna go up to them and say, hi, my name is so-and-so. And you start to talk to them, you start to realize you have common ground, you begin to build a relationship with them. So same premise here. You're going from the image to a written article to an opt-in or a sale. Now, from the written article, sometimes you can go straight to the sale because somebody who may be looking for the solution immediately doesn't really wanna wait. But if you know that they're not looking for the sale, but rather they are somebody who is interested, you can get them to sign up on your email list. And then of course, from that point on, build a relationship with them. And then of course, get the sale later down the road. So now to give you an example of this in real life, let's say for example that your image shows a picture of a no sugar cupcake. And this is gonna attract somebody who cannot eat sugar and has health issues. So kind of tapping into the example that I talked about earlier. This could be somebody who maybe is diabetic or somebody who has a health condition who can't eat sugar. So you're gonna have on the image, it's not gonna just be an image, it's gonna be an image with some text that you can grab them in. You're gonna have a good description to tell people what the image is all about. Now, if they click on that image and they get a cupcake and that is made of sugar, brown sugar, sugar cane, even coconut sugar, they're gonna be upset and leave. Or let's say you don't even have any text and it's a sugar cupcake and somebody clicks on that and then they get sent to an article that is like a no sugar cupcake. They're gonna get upset with that. That is why the image is so crucial. It's not just about a beautiful image, but it's an image that has a good description, that has text on it, and that has a call to action. Or worse, they're gonna go back to Pinterest and alert everyone else that this image may be misleading or anything like that. And that's just not good for you and your reputation. But if they go to the content and they find out that you've made in this amazing, tasty cupcake that uses no sugar at all and is healthy, guess what? They're gonna go back to Pinterest, they're gonna tell everybody, they're gonna say, hey, I tried this, this is amazing, this is something that you're gonna wanna try as well. They are gonna become your fans, and of course, they're gonna become your voice. And essentially, they're gonna become your marketers. So you've got your, yourself a potential customer, a potential person that's gonna market for you. Now imagine adding them onto your email list and then of course building that relationship over time. They're more, most likely inclined to actually buy from you. And that is what we call a profitable targeted automation machine by using Pinterest. And that's the goal of today. That's the goal of this video course is to get you in that mindset so that you understand that this is the power of Pinterest, but it must be done right. So now let's talk about the size of your images. Should your images be small? Should they be big? What size should they be? What should they look like? Let's talk about that in the next video. Okay, so welcome to video number five. Let's talk about visual real estate matters. So visual real estate is not talking about houses here, but it could be visual, it could be virtual real estate, same thing. Basically, all that means is that the size of your image matters a lot. So imagine the image or even the screen right here. 
This screen right here just means that how much is your image taking up of the page? So if the image is big, then of course your real estate is going to be bigger. If it's small and you're not taking a whole lot of space, then your real estate virtually or visually is going to be not a whole lot. Now, why does that matter? Well, did you know that Pinterest allows you to pin graphics that are vertically oriented, meaning that they're long, which means that you're going to take more real estate compared to that of a square. So if you had the option to either use a square or a vertical rectangle, which one would you use? Well, the vertical rectangle, of course, right? Because not only does it take more space out of the page, it definitely shows up compared to the, all the other images. And not only that, in addition to that, it stands out. Now, when you're dealing with vertical rectangles, the problem is you need to make sure that your images look good. Because with a square image, you just put up an image, you can put a call to action, put up a important information on that and put it up and that's it. But with a vertical, you begin to realize that you need to really make it look good. It's not just a bunch of images. It's got to look really good. And don't worry about that. We're going to talk about that in just a second. So if you're not a graphic designer, it doesn't matter. You're going to be able to create some amazing pictures. Now, going back to why this is important and why taking up more virtual real estate is important. And this is because the more of the page that you're going to take up, the better. The smaller of your image is the less of the page you take up. And worse, you're going to be overpowered by folks on Pinterest that are using these longer pins. Because the longer pin is actually the strategy that will actually work. Now, this is a proven method that we discovered while testing our own images. We found that the longer pins would actually show up on the page. They got pinned more because they were obviously being shown a lot more. And a lot of times longer pins will allow somebody to look at the image longer than they would a shorter image, if that makes sense. And we figured this out as well with sharing notes with other successful Pinterest marketing campaign owners. We asked them, we said, hey, what is your best size? And they said vertical long pins were their best size. Now, what exactly size should that be? We'll get into that at a later video. So if you spend a lot of time studying other people's pictures and looking through magazine photos, so if you take a magazine from a bookstore and you look through that, you begin to realize what people really want to see visually in your niche. That's why I showed you the method earlier where we looked at the magazines and then we kind of reverse engineered it by going to the website and took a look at that. But if you look at magazines and how they're laid out and all of that, if you can do something similar and lay your images out like that, it's going to be more appealing on Pinterest because you're going to be competing with everybody else who are mainly just uploading images and that's it. But if your images look really nice and appealing and attractive, you're going to get more clicks. Now to create a long pin, you have to put a few photos together, literally stacked on top of each other. So if you think about it, a square, a square is just a square, but a longer pin is going to have several squares on top of each other. It might have three squares, it might have four squares, but of course you don't want to make it too long as well because there's a difference between being short and sweet and being too long winded, right? If you think about somebody who is going to talk about a specific topic, you want short straight to the point, you want the information really quick and that's it. So similar to this, you want to have a long pin, but you don't want to have a pin that is way too long. So that's just something to keep in mind as you are thinking about how you can go ahead and create these long pins. So on the Pinterest feed, they make the pin stand out a little more by being long. But like I said, you want to make sure that 
there's a fine line between too long and too short. So tweaking the sizes of the images is a great technique to get more attention on the Pinterest board compared to that of the other pins that are smaller image sizes. So in the next few videos, we're gonna discuss one type of long graphic that attracts a lot of attention, that works really well, that you can easily create without having any sort of professional graphic designer experience. Hello and welcome back. This is video number six. Let's talk about an attractive pin and what that looks like. So according to a recent article by HubSpot.com, publishers who use infographics grow in traffic on average about 12% more than those who don't really use infographics. So we found the same, that to be true that after we started using infographics, we started seeing an increase of clicks and not just only any click, but high quality clicks. Now, if you're not familiar with them, they're basically long vertical images, which turns great content into eye candy. Or in other words, you can turn great content instead of turning it into just a bunch of text. You turn it into a graphic that visually makes sense. Now, there are many different types of infographics, and we'll show you in just a second what they look like and how you can go about creating your very own infographic. Now, this is how many companies take really boring content and make it exciting. So let's go ahead and take a look at some infographics and the tools that you can use to create them. So to give you some ideas, you can simply go to google.com and type in the keyword infographic and go to the images search engine and you'll be able to see some examples of infographics in general. Now, if you want to niche down and go for a specific topic, you can also type in infographic space and then of course the topic. And then you might be able to see some ideas on infographics that you could potentially create. Obviously you don't copy and plagiarize, but just use it to get some ideas. Now, if we scroll down, you have a better idea of what an infographic looks like. So as you can see here, there are more pictures and more graphics, more statistics, more great looking visual content compared to that of just text. So imagine being able to create one of these and putting them on Pinterest and most likely you'll be able to really stand out because it's really eye catching. Now the question is, how do you go about creating these beautifully created graphics? So there are several ways to go about doing this. You can either create it yourself from scratch. Obviously that would take too much time. So you wanted to find an infographic template. So you can go to graphicriver.net and if you go this route, you will be essentially meeting it halfway manually. So you're not going to do it totally manually, but you will be editing a template typically with Photoshop. Now, if I go to graphicriver.net and I type in infographic food, for example, we scroll down and you're able to see that there are 730 infographics related to food. So as you can see, compared to that of hiring somebody, which typically can run anywhere from $100 to several hundred dollars because they do take time to create, but they are well worth it at the end of the day, it's only about $8 each infographic. So they can run around $8 or sometimes $5 to $10. Now, if you want the easiest route, the easiest is to simply utilize a tool and we've used many tools and really come down to one tool in particular, which is called pictochart.com. That's P I K T O C H A R T.com. Now, when you go to the site, you're able to create infographics very, very easily. If you click on the infographic here, 
Initially, there are many free templates. But if you do an upgrade, you'll get access to a lot of other fancy templates. Now, editing templates is simply by pointing your mouse at something and clicking it, and then of course editing it via either the text or the image. So this definitely makes it easier compared to downloading it off of graphicriver.net, editing it with Photoshop, and then exporting it. And all of these are pre-made, so you have access to typically hundreds. And as you can see here, if you upgrade, it's about 600 templates and new templates every single week. So we've used PictoChart for many years. We have downgraded because we're not really creating as many infographics, but it's great when you're just getting started. Hello and welcome to video number seven. We're going to talk about the anatomy. So as we're talking about images, I'm sure you're thinking, okay, what exactly am I supposed to put inside of the graphic? We've talked about graphics. We've talked about the size of the graphic. Now what? Is there a blueprint or a formula? And yes, there is. And that's what we're going to cover in this specific video. Now, while you can get creative and add whatever you like, there are a few things that every pinworthy image should contain, at minimum, to get the desired quality click. So let's talk about that right now. The image should show the following. First, it should show the end result or the end desire in a high quality picture. In other words, it should show whoever you're trying to target what they want to create. So if you take a look at the examples of food, if somebody puts an image up of some tasty chicken parmesan dish, then in the back of the mind of your prospect, they're thinking, oh, that looks really yummy, that looks tasty, and you put a really good description and they really love it. They're gonna click it because they want to know how to create that yummy, chicken parmesan dish. So that in itself is the end result. So you don't want to choose any image. You want to choose the right image, if that makes sense. Second of all, you need to build curiosity to click to learn how to achieve the end result. So in other words, that needs to be in the picture. So going back to the chicken parmesan example, it looks tasty. So the fact that it looks tasty, people want to know how did you create it? So your goal is to get them interested enough to click your image and land on the content piece. Your goal isn't to sell them immediately, rather just to get them curious and interested. That's it. Remember, when it comes to selling online, it's not about getting them to click and buy. Like we talked about earlier, when it comes to relationships, you don't go up to somebody and say, hey, would you love to, you know, do this and that with me, go and hang out, be best friends kind of thing. You go up to them and usually you say hi and you kind of pique their interest and you begin to find common ground and then you go from there. So very similar to this concept as well here. The image should also show a call to action text. Of course, telling them what to do to learn how is very important. So going back to the example earlier, they're going to want to learn how. So you're going to want to put some text in the image that tells them what to expect after they click. So people need to be told what to do. Never, never assume anything. Never assume that they know what to do always tell them. So you're going to need to have a call to action text that says, click here to get recipe. So something short and sweet, click to watch how to create this recipe or whatever you're trying to sell. So never assume anything and tell them the exact call to action. Now try to keep that within just a few words. You don't want to go overboard because remember, as people are going through Pinterest, they're scanning. They're looking really, really fast with their eyes on a bunch of images. So whatever image grabs them in, and not only that tells them what to do, 
to get what they want, they're going to click. So at the end of the day, you want something that people can save or even share with their friends or their family, or they just pin it and then they share it in their board and in their group. And then their group finds out about it and then you get more traffic. So that's why you want to really set this up carefully and correctly. Now, of course, not only is the image important, but you really need to have a good description within the pin. So adding a really good description about the chicken Parmesan dish, you can say this is easy. This can be created within less than 30 minutes. And this is how many calories. It's a low calorie diet, low cholesterol diet, uh, something that's appealing to your audience. So if you know your audience, which goes back to why it's very important to understand who is going to click and what do they face in real life. So let's say, for example, that you have an image that says no sugar cupcakes and you are targeting people who are diabetic. So you want to put the call to action with that and then put that in the description. You can say, you know, if you're diabetic or if you are on a specific diet where you're not supposed to eat sugar, then this tastes really good. It only takes this amount of time. It, it'll save you money too because it doesn't cost a lot of money. It is only like three ingredients. So it's easy, cheap, and it's fast. So those elements, actually, if you utilize those elements in your copy, in your description, those are elements that people want to know because people don't want to spend a lot of money, typically, and they don't want to spend a lot of time because time is money. So again, if you talk about recipes, it needs to have a very good mouth-watering description of what the finished dish is like and what they're going to expect if they click on it. You always want to be transparent and tell people a little bit of what to expect on the other side. So when I mean other side, I mean when they click, they are sent to a piece of content. And that will actually help your conversions and it'll also help gain trust because people will realize that you're being genuine. You're not hiding anything or anything like that. You are telling them up front what to expect. And when they click on that, they are more likely to trust you. So transparency is very, very important. Being authentic is really important as well. Now, another example is if you look at popular restaurants. These popular places have really good menus with really good descriptions of the food with pictures. So they do a really good job. And if you think about it, people go in the restaurant, they're ready to buy, but they're interested. They're, they're, they don't know exactly what to buy, but they look through the menu, they see what they like, they buy it. So looking at these, because it's more of an instant buy, these are really, really good to look at. So menus from popular restaurants, the next time you go out to take a look, take a look at how they do it and pick a restaurant that is doing really, really well. Now, sometimes you can go on Google and do a search on the restaurant and find restaurants that you really like that are doing well and look at them, look at, see if they have a menu on their website and see how they've laid things out and use those descriptions. But if you keep with what I talked about in the previous slide, which was saving time, saving money, and not as many ingredients or not as many steps, those elements actually can help convert really well. So there is some element of sales copywriting in there. Basically making it sound even more appealing using words is key. So you're having the image, getting them to attract, to look at it, and then you got the description that kind of closes the deal to get them to click. And then when they click, you've got really good content that is congruent to the image and they are impressed because the reality is not many people do that. So if you're one of the few that do that, you're going to be ahead of your competition. So like I said, even though the visual is great, you really need to back it up with a good description as well. All right. So with that said, let's move on to video number eight and we'll talk about a reverse engineering hack that will help you in getting ideas on what your images can include. 
Hello and welcome to video number eight. This is the reverse engineering hack. Now that you understand how do you go about getting ideas on what images to use, the hack is really to take a look at the trending pins and reverse engineer it. So let me show you how to do this right now. So applying this hack is very easy to do. All you have to do is simply go to two sites. The first one is of course, Pinterest.com. And the second site I'll show you in just a minute. So if you go to Pinterest.com and up at the top, you want to enter the search term. And in this case, since I was talking about chicken Parmesan earlier, I decided to stick with chicken Parmesan recipes. Now, as you go through here, I want you to point at and want you to think which one actually stands out. So these are just images and you'll notice that a lot of people, they just upload images and images look great and they definitely will get clicks. But if you scroll down, this one here has not only a good image, but they also have a good title. So if we scroll down further, this one has an image and uh, they also have text and it doesn't look horrible, but if you scroll down further, you get the idea that just putting text on an image doesn't really work either. So taking the photograph, if, if the person who took this photograph here, maybe took it on the side, it would look better. And maybe they used something like PictoChart to create an infographic or an editing tool to make things look better. And we'll talk about tools that you can use to make things better in just a minute. But if you scroll down further, you begin to see images that really catch your eye. So this one here, this one has an image and then text and then an image, but the text looks really good. So if you scroll down further, the one on the left hand side here looks really good as well. So by doing a little bit of research and doing a little bit of, of reverse engineering, you can get an idea of what is actually doing well. Now I want to pause for a minute and just tell you a tool that you can use to create these simple graphics. So if you don't want to create an infographic, that's fine. But if you want to create something simple like this, then there's a tool called Canva. So that is canva.com, C-A-N-V-A.com. And as you can see here, you're able to create really beautiful pictures without having Photoshop. So you can edit this anywhere you are, as long as you have access to the internet. Now, what's nice about Canva is you're not limited to just posters. In fact, if you go up here, you're able to see the different templates and designs. So if I go back one page and I go to features, you can see the document types of the cars, logos, flyers, banners, reports, resumes, postcards, proposals, infographics as well, book covers, newsletters, all sorts of things that you can create, magazine covers. You can even go further and create your social media graphics as well, but that's going a little bit on a different route. So now that you know a tool that you can use to create nice looking graphics aside of pictochart.com, let's head back on to pinterest.com. Okay. So what you want to do is scroll down and then look for an image that really stands out. So as we're scrolling through here, I feel like the one that's really standing out to me is this one here and this one here. Now, if you notice, if you put your mouse over each image at the bottom here, you're going to see the domain name of the person that owns this image. So we put over here, we can see this is inspiredtaste.net. We've got chefsavvy.com. We've got kitchenswagger.com. So what we do is we find the domain name. And the next step is we obviously can see that these people are professionals. So we want to take a further look at them. So what we do is we head on over to a site called buzzsumo.com. That's buzzsumo.com. And then immediately you see content analyzer. And normally this will show up by default. The first thing that you'll see, if not, you can click on 
content research, content analyzer, and then you'll want to enter the domain name. So in this case, it's kitchenswagger.com. And if we scroll down, we can see all the content that BuzzSumo has essentially extracted. And we can get an idea of how well the content is doing. So we can see this one here is getting about 300 Pinterest shares. So it looks like the majority of their traffic is actually coming from Pinterest. And that's a good sign because that tells us that the way they've created their graphic is a good sign that tells us and confirmation that their images are working and people are sharing their content. So what you can do is you can simply click on their link. Now, before we do that, let's just try something. Let's see if we can do chicken swagger chicken and do a search. So that doesn't really give us the data we're, we're looking for the chicken parmesan but anyways it looks like they're very consistent so what I do is I take a look at the highest content piece that is getting the highest amount of Pinterest shares and then we take a look at the content and just see how they've laid out their content so how to grill the best pizza you've ever had how to make the best chicken parmesan you've ever had so they start with an image, content, some bold text, then they have images, images, lots of images. And then they go to the recipes. So what you're trying to do here is get an idea of why people are pinning it and how you can apply that to your own content. Obviously, you're not plagiarizing or copying them. You're simply getting ideas on how you can lay things out for your own site because what we found is that with Pinterest a lot of times the content for a specific demographic a specific audience a specific niche can be very different than other audiences and other niches so that's why taking a look at your competition essentially and what is actually trending and which one is getting good Pinterest shares and all of that and then stick with that. So that's a very simple hack that you can apply. So as a recap, number one, go to Pinterest.com, do a search for your niche or specific image that you're searching for, and then take a look at the best image, and then go to BuzzSumo, second of all, that's step number two, and then type in the domain name, and then take a look at their highest Pinterest shares, and from that, take a look at how they've laid things out on their blog or their website, and then try to take a look at a few, again, and see if there's a similarity and a commonality. So that's it, and hope you enjoyed that. Let's move on to the next video. Hello, and welcome to video number nine, and this is gonna be pin automation. Just wanna say congrats on reaching the end of this video course. So this is sort of a bonus video that is gonna make your pinning much easier. Pinning lots of high quality images is crucial and you really wanna be consistent and you wanna schedule it ahead of time. That way you can schedule weeks in advance and then you can focus on the long term as much as possible. And by doing that and by being consistent, that will actually help you get a good amount of traffic if you followed this formula. So obviously you can't be near a computer 24 seven either. So really finding a tool that can help you automate this process as much as possible is important. So let's discuss some tools that will help you with this process. So there are tons and tons of different tools out there that you can use, that you can pay for. But over the years, one tool in particular that we have seen really sustain the test of time and really update their features and all of that is ViralTag.com. So as you can see, it says the number one social media marketing tool for sharing visuals. So it's not just for Pinterest, it's for other social media platforms as well. 
But in terms of utilizing this with Pinterest, it's actually very, very good. So you can schedule unlimited posts so they don't charge you per post. You can recycle evergreen content. You can collaborate with your team. And best of all, you can analyze what is actually happening. We found that there's some tools out there that will post stuff, but you have no idea on earth what in the world is actually working and what in the world is actually happening. So as you can see here, you can schedule your content ahead of time. So you can put the image, you can put hashtags, which is something else that we highly recommend that you do. And then of course you can put the URL where you, you want to send them to. So as you can see here, you can upload, you can add to edit, you can schedule posts in bulk. So you don't have to do it one by one. And there's a lot of other things. You can do content curation, which is a little bit different than what we're talking about, but those are more advanced strategies. But based on what we're talking about in this course, this is essentially one of the better tools that we have found over the years. So rather than having to scour the internet and look for the tool that is best, we can definitely say this one right here is the way to go. Now, it does cost money. As you can see here, there's an individual account. You really only need the individual account. And the small business is a little bit more money, and then the branding is a lot more money. Now, as you can see, you definitely don't need the small business or the brand. The individual is just enough to have. And one suggestion that I have to you is that don't even get access to viral tag at all until you have actually begun to get into the habit of doing it yourself. Once you've done it yourself and once you become overwhelmed and you need to take it to the next level, that's when you can use viral tag. So that's a tool that we highly recommend that has worked really well. And we hope you enjoyed this course and make sure that you take the knowledge that you've learned and apply it and remember if you keep it simple and keep your funnel congruent from your image to your content and so forth and follow the blueprint step by step and be consistent at it you will begin to see some traffic